So we're going to close out chapter 15 with coupled equilibria, or section 15.3. And so there's the learning outcomes expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those. All right, so coupled equilibria. So we've talked a bunch about equilibria in chapter 13, 14, and 15. And this section 15.3 basically ties that together in that you can have more than one equilibria happening at a time. And so we'll take an example here where we have Ag plus ions floating around in solution. And as we showed previously, we can add something like Cl minus, and it'll make this AgCl uh, uh, solid. It'll make a precipitate. And so we have this equilibrium, Ag plus plus Cl minus, giving us AgCl. You guys will recognize that is the reverse of the Ksp, or 1 over Ksp. And we have some number associated with that. How favorable is it to make that precipitate? We can take the same exact solution and we can add something like NH3 ions to it. And NH3 plus Ag makes this complex ion AgNe3 2, and this is plus, so it's a soluble species, aqueous. And so we can draw another equilibrium where we have Ag plus plus NH3 giving us AgNH3 2 plus, and you'll notice this is the K formation constant for this complex ion. I can take the same solution and add some um, Br minus to it. If I had Br minus, it's going to form a precipitate AgBr, and again, that's a Ksp. So we have Ag plus plus Br minus in equilibrium with AgBr. You'll notice this is uh, 1 over Ksp because we flipped this equation around, um, and we have a number associated with that KSP. And then we can take something like this sodium uh, sulfide species, we can mix this together, we can actually make a new complex ion. We can take any Ag plus ions that were sitting around in solution, add S2O3 to minus, and make this Ag S2O3 to, to minus uh, soluble ion. And again, this is a K formation constant. And so yeah, this is a lot of steps. You don't have to know the particulars of these reactions, but the, the, the take home here is that all these equilibrium reactions are happening at the same time. And so it's not like this one happens and then it's done. There's no more equilibrium here between AgCl, Cl minus, and Ag plus. No, this equilibrium still exists even on this end of the equation. And so the Ag plus amount of that disappears here and goes to this affects the equilibrium over here. And all these equilibria are happening simultaneously. And so that's what it means by multiple equilibria. You have common ions between these guys, you have things affecting the equilibria differently, and the thing that happens here affects this, it affects this, it affects this, and that's the point of multiple equilibria. Is that they're not behaving independently, they are all interacting and they're all happening simultaneously. And so we've, we've kind of talked about this idea before, particularly in chapter 13 when we talked about multi-step reactions. We can have equilibrium described by equilibrium constant K1. We have another equilibrium described by equilibrium constant K2. And we can actually combine these together and get an overall equilibrium. And so you can think of this as a two-step process. That's step one, that's step two. This is the overall reaction for rot reactants and products, and we have a K overall value. And so as we showed previously, K1 times K2 equals K overall. If you can and combine these equilibria constants together, you can get an overall equilibrium constant. And so, again, this is something we covered in chapter 13, but it's describing the same phenomena we're going to talk about in this one. Uh, we're going to talk about combining equilibria. And so let's take this, this, this second step of the process where we took, you know, we had Ag+, plus, we added Cl-, minus, we had this equilibrium that gave us AgCl, then we can add NH3 to this solution and we can generate this complex AgNH3 2 plus ion, complex ion and solution. And so we have two equilibria going on, right? We have AgCl solid, giving us Ag plus and Cl minus, and we have Ag plus uh, plus two NH3s giving us a, this N Ag NH3 two plus complex ion. And so we have a Ksp, a Kf. Uh, the notation doesn't really matter. The big take home here is you have things here that are going to affect this equilibrium here, right? There's an Ag plus here, there's an Ag plus here. Changing this or changing this or changing this is going to, well, not changing this, changing this is going to affect this equilibrium. So the question is how? So we can sum these together and get an overall equilibrium. We can calculate an overall equilibrium constant. Uh, but the point is these two things aren't acting independently. And so we can draw this equilibrium. We can draw this equilibrium. We can draw an overall equilibrium where we've combined those guys together.
And so we can put a number behind this. Again, each one of these is just products over reactants. We take this times this to get a K overall. We're canceling the AG plus is giving this overall equation. There's products to the stoichiometry here. There's reactants to the stoichiometry. Solid doesn't show up in the equation. There's an overall equilibrium equation for the overall solution. And so we have numbers. We can plug and chug those numbers. This times this gives us a equilibrium constant for the overall process. And so again, you can draw these independently you can combine them together and have an overall solution. The reality is the overall solution looks more like this than these guys behaving independently. It basically says they're coupled to each other. Uh, one thing that's convenient about having these individually drawn is you can see that AG plus matters. And so in this equation, you can't directly see how AG plus matters, but it does in these other equations. And so let's think about that a little bit, how one perturbs the other. And so if we have you know, this KSP equilibrium, we have this, this, this KF equilibrium. If we add Cl minus to the solution, the question is how does it perturb these equilibria? And so this one, we see there's a Cl minus. This one, we don't see a Cl minus, but it turns out if we add Cl minus, we will affect this equilibrium, but we'll do so indirectly. And so think about this from Le Chatelet's principle. What happens to this equilibrium if we add Cl minus? This goes up it's going to shift to the left. It's going to form a precipitate. It's going to generate more AGCL. But a byproduct of that process is we're going to decrease the amount of AG+. Plus. If we decrease the amount of AG plus here, it's the same solution, which means it's going to decrease the amount of AG plus over here. If this decreases, that's going to shift to the left. And so we can look at this in an overall equation. We can say if this goes up, it's going to shift to the left. It's going to convert some of this complex ion to this AgCl solid. And so adding Cl minus doesn't directly affect this equilibrium, but it does so indirectly. And so, yeah, uh, we can think about other things like adding NH3. Again, there's no NH3 in this equilibrium, but we can think about how NH3 is going to affect this equilibrium, right? And so if NH3 goes up, that shifts to the right. If that shifts to the right, there's less Ag+. Plus. If there's less Ag+, plus, it's going to make it more soluble. And so in this case, um, it, it's going to make the AgCl dissolve and generate more H+, plus, Ag+, plus, because this equilibrium shifted to the right. And so overall, we're adding NH3, we're shifting this way, we're turning some of the solid into a complex ion. And you can imagine this being very useful, right? If you want to dissolve more of the solid, you can do perturbations to things other than that KSP equation to make it more soluble. And this is an example of that. And so, yeah, you can take home, we're going to have more AGNH3 complex ion, we're going to have less of the AGCl solid. And so we can do the same thing talking about uh, uh, acid base chemistry and solubility. In fact, we can take any equilibrium constant we have. We have Ks, we have Kbs, Kfs, Kws, Kcs, Ks that don't have subscripts. We can combine any of those together. But one particularly interesting one or, or one that, that uh, builds on things we've talked about in chapter 14 and 15 is solubility and pH. And so let's take an example here. We have this PBF2 solid, PB2 plus and 2F minus. Not very soluble species. You can see the KSP value of 4 times 10 to the minus 8. It does not favor products at all. In fact, it favors this by 8 orders of magnitude. It would rather be the solid. But interestingly, if I add H plus to this solution, I shift the equilibrium and I generate much more of the ions. And so again, you'll note, there's no H plus in this equation. So we can't just add up arrows or down arrows, at least not directly, because this is indirectly affecting it. And it's doing it through a secondary equilibria. Because if we look at this equation, we'll recognize something really important. F minus is actually a, uh, a Bronsted-Lowry base. And so if that's a Bronsted-Lowry base, it means that we can take F minus, and if we add H plus to it, we're effectively adding uh, H plus, we're shifting this to the left. If we're shifting this to the left, it means the F minus decreases. If F minus decreases over here, F minus has to decrease over here, and this equilibrium shifts to the right. And so again, the solubility increases as I add H plus, but it's not always going to do that. It only does that because we recognize one of the species here is an acid or a base, and adding acid to it affects this guy decreases it, shifts it to the right, makes it more soluble. And so uh, this is why, um, you know, acids can dissolve things like lead fluoride. They can make it more soluble and get more lead ions into that solution.
And so, yeah, you can think about this in terms of, uh, you know, memorizing a set of rules, insoluble bases dissolve in acidic solutions, insoluble acids dissolve in basic solutions, or you can actually look at the constituent species, which is what I'd recommend. And so if you look at things like copper sulfide, right, it goes to copper two plus and S two minus. And so you have to ask yourself, is there an acidic or basic species here? If there is a basic species and I add H plus, it's going to generate a new equilibrium, right? So this S2 minus is actually a base. Combine that with H plus, we get this HS minus. And so as H plus goes up, we shift this right, we decrease that amount. If we decrease this, we shift this to the right. And so again, this is chapter 13, Le Chatelet's principle, but combining multiple equilibria. And so in this case, if you add acid, the solubility of this complex or this copper sulfide increases. Um, here's another example, NH4Cl makes NH4 uh, plus, plus Cl minus. Um, this is the conjugate of HCl, so this isn't basic at all. This is same as sodium chloride, but this guy right here we'll recognize as a um, an acid. NH4 plus is an acid. So if I add H plus to this, what does it do to this equilibrium? There's no H plus directly in this equation, but H plus is involved in this equilibrium. So NH4 plus gives you NH3 plus H plus. And so this, in this, if we have this solution before we add the H plus, it's not just existing as NH4 plus. Instead, there's also NH3 and H plus floating around. And so by adding more H plus, I shift this to the left, I increase the amount of NH4 plus. If I increase that, I shift it to the left, I make this guy less soluble. And so this is an acidic species, I'm adding acid, it makes it less soluble. This was a basic species, I add acid, it makes it more soluble. One more example. Um, that's the same equation, but in this case, we're going to add OH. And so we're going to perturb it by in increasing the pH, decreasing the amount of H plus, increasing the amount of OH minus. And so in this case, we have a basic equilibrium where NH3 plus H2O gives us NH4 plus and OH minus. Add OH minus, shift it left, decrease the amount of NH4 plus. If that decreases, that shifts to the right, that becomes more soluble. So you can see again, adding acid or, or adding base to the reaction can make a solution more or less soluble depending on the species involved in the equilibrium. And so here's an example. It turns out you can actually do the math to figure out where that threshold is. And this isn't necessarily an expectation of this class, but it's kind of cool that you can do nonetheless. If you take something like magnesium hydroxide that's only partially soluble to make Mg2 plus and 2OH minus, um, we, we know that if we increase the pH, right, we're going to add more OH minus, it's going to shift to the left. If we decrease the pH, it's going to become more soluble, right? If we add more H plus, H plus is going to interact with OH minus. This is going to go down. It's going to shift to the right. And so we know that at, at low pH, it's going to be more soluble. At high pH, it's going to be less soluble. Turns out we can actually figure out that threshold using our KSP and pH calculations. And so KSP is equal to concentration of the, the product of the stoichiometry, product of the stoichiometry. Uh, turns out this number is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 11. If we do our ice table math, which is truncated here, we can figure out what the solubility of this is. And so if the solubility of this guy is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4, well, interestingly, that tells us the OH minus concentration at saturation. And so we can do that. We can find that number at a saturated condition. It's 2.8 times 10 to the minus 4. That's how much OH minus we'll have in solution. And so we can actually take the negative log of that. We can figure out what the pOH of that solution is. If it's 3.55, if this is at 25 degrees C, which is not noted here, but we're going to assume the pH of this solution at saturation is 10.45. And so interestingly, that's the threshold where you get the increase and decrease in solubility. So anything less than pH 10.45, it increases the solubility. Anything greater than 10.45, it decreases the solubility. So you can literally find out to the exact threshold where acid base transitions transitions from more soluble to less soluble and it's through uh, several steps right we know ksp we learned this in chapter 15 at least in the the 15.1 and then we talked about you know ph poh we learned this in chapter 14 and so these concepts all tie together right even though this is a ksp equation it is affected by the ph of solution because ph directly or indirectly affects the species involved
All right, so to summarize, solution can contain multiple equilibria that are not independent. I'd say more often than not, that actually is the case. Rarely do you get one thing isolated, particularly in biochemistry, all equilibria are related to each other. Um, but we can figure out the uh, equilibrium constant as well as the overall equation by combining those equilibria together. And we can make predictions about how adding or removing something, whether it's acid base or common ion or making a complex ion, we can figure out how that perturbs the equilibria using the rules of Le Chatelet's principle, right? If one thing increases, it shifts one direction, decreases, shifts another direction. Uh, we can use this uh, on the common ion effect and solubility, combining KFs and KSPs. We can know the impact of pH on solubilities, combining K, KBs, and KSP values. Um, I mean, going beyond this, basically this applies to any equilibria, right? We could combine any equilibria together and know how one influences the other. And that's the point of the multiple equilibria uh, section. All right, so that closes out chapter 15. We talked about precipitation dissolution in terms of KSP values and solubility constant. We talked all about Lewis's acids and bases, forming complex ions, dissociating complex ions, electron donors, electron acceptors. And then we combined everything we know about equilibria to make these coupled equilibria, where one equilibria and impacting one equilibria can affect other equilibria. And so, yeah, that closes out chapter 15. And next, we'll dive into chapter 16.